Good evening, everyone, and welcome to September 4th Shelter in Place SIP. Uh, this is, we've lost count how many weeks in a row? 25, thank you for the studio. 25 weeks in a row, maybe 26. Uh, but this is the event that everyone looks forward to. It has become the new date night, and it's something that we look forward to every Friday night. And for those of you that are just joining us, let me give you a little bit of background information. My name is Martin Cody, co-founder of Cellar Angels. Uh, Cellar Angels is an online direct to consumer wine company that we founded 10 years ago to basically be storytellers exclusively to wineries in Napa and Sonoma. So we single-handedly pick and curate wines from small limited production producers. We make them available on our website or in any one of our three wine clubs. And a portion of every single transaction goes to a charity you select. So we bring the best of wine country to you. And when we founded the company 10 years ago, I promise you, we did not think we would be doing virtual tastings 10 years down the road in the middle of a global pandemic. <laughs> so uh, it, it is a bit daunting. Uh, for those of you that have, were putting children back to school this week, I, I imagine that would be something in a rare instance where you actually went to the school and everyone's doing homeschooling, work from home. Uh, but thankfully, we have wonderful, wonderful wine. We get the opportunity, as I say, week in and week out, just because we have to physically distance doesn't mean we have to socially distance. Wine brings people together. It's something what I've said for years, even before we started Cellar Angels, we owned a bricks and mortar wine retail store. Uh, and, and it brings people together. It's a magical beverage. Very few beverages do anything like this in the world. And when you get a chance to meet the small limited production wineries, specifically those in Napa and Sonoma, I think we're better people as a result. And tonight is no exception. Tonight we have with us a fantastic couple that is going to tell their story and we're gonna help tell their story. We're gonna drink an absolute mind boggling amount of wine, uh, at least they are. And without further ado, I wanna introduce you to April and Andrew Nall from Nall Winery. Cheers, you guys. Hey, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> now, I have a green screen. They have a spectacular live image uh, from their winery in the uh, Dry Creek. Dry Creek Valley. Yep, Dry, Dry Creek, Creek Valley. Valley. California. Yep. And we have a little Google Earth later on that we're gonna show you people exactly where this winery is. But I think it's fascinating because it is a working winery, multiple generations. We're gonna get into the whole story in a little bit. Uh, but you will probably hear some wind. They're outside. You will probably even maybe hear a helicopter going over because as everybody that's been paying attention to wine country, there, there is some challenges. Uh, I want to say hello to the Randalls, Kay Jerica, the Greasies are on, Scotland Kiefer is on. And by the way, the Greasies, the Greasies might actually be co-hosts one time because they ha they've been on 25 consecutive sips. They haven't missed a single episode. Uh, nice. Uh, nice. And Jeff and, Jeff and Jane, uh, the, uh, by the way, Andrew and April, that picture I showed you of the setup, that's Jeff and Jane Greasy. So those Ooh, guys we know how to be there. Oh. Yeah, yeah, you guys know how to party. That's great. <laughs> they know what they're doing. So in my glass is, is the 2018 Zinfandel. And, and when people hear California Zinfandel, I think a, a few things pop to their head. Uh, it might be over extraction. It might be jammy. It might be Lodi uh, and those sorts of things. But you stylistically approach Zinfandel in, in a very unique way that has been part of the, the passion and kind of the, the craft of the family for generations. Tell me a little bit about your Zinfandel style. And Andrew, I'll let you take this one since you're the winemaker. Yeah. And, and, and tell me a little bit about why it's different and, and what, it, what it speaks to and what you're after. Yeah, so I, I'm after elegance and making the greatest Zinfandel possible in California, or I wanna go out to say in the world. Um, and it's really based on years of studying the great French wines, really, of Bordeaux. I mean, handed down stylistically from my father, Doug Nall, And really, we're treating this Zin like a great Bordeaux. Um, and so instead of using Cab Merlot, Cab Franc, we're using Zin, Petit Syrah, and Carignan. And I'm using those techniques to get a wine that's balanced, elegant, age-worthy, has good brightness, but also smoothness in the tannin and something that could last 10 at least years, but also 20 years. So when I'm out in the vineyard, I'm trying to see how the Zen will last that long 
and I'm not trying to make something that you just, I mean, we're drinking it pretty young right now, but that you would just bottle it and drink it. I mean, we even wait six months before we release it after we bottle it. So these are, these are classic Zans um, for the whole uh, classic way of winemaking for the whole world that wine has been in existence that people decided that great wine some of the first gross came from France or in the world yeah, exactly. that were style. Um, we didn't choose that just because those are first gross, but they just know they just noticed when they were tasting in the seventies that those wines lasted so long. And then we did the wine chemistry on it and we checked the varietal makeup and the alcohol levels weren't super high and the pHs were a little lower. And so my dad fell in love with that, the flavor, but the style and just, and the, the challenge to make a wine like that, where you don't just roll out of bed, you really study it, you put your time in, you put your work in, you build the vineyard, you build the wine, and it, it pays off in the end. These are polished. Yeah. So I, 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 yeah. I got to jump in with my uh, more aura. Well, so these wines are um, aged in French oak. Um, they're always under 14% alcohol. They're bone dry. They're made from 93 year olds, estate, dry farms in Fidel that his great great grandparents planted in 1927. And those vines are actually right here. So, All right, uh, so let me, let me do this real quick because I, I see 20 plus people jumping on. Barb Randall, Caitlin Greasy, Clarence Kwan, James Brown, oh, uh, uh, Jan Kiefer, Gene Golden, Jeff and Jane, we talked about Jerry Lutlanu, Joseph Kermaker, Julie Fogarty. Hello, Julie Fogarty, fellow Chicagoan. Carla Henderlong. You guys might know Carla. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. Sensi. <laughs> Carla. Uh, hey, Carla. Hey, Jerrica. Lee Nall is on. That's his mom. Oh, hey, mom. Hello, Lee. <laughs> uh, Linda Margavio, Neil Wanamaker. They Neil. named a trophy, yeah. named a trophy after him in golf. Yeah. Ray Linkus, Rick Nall. Ray. Uh, Rick. Uh, Ron Mercer, Syrian Ron. Bob Berg. That's my mom. <laughs> That's my mom and dad. <laughs> Serene. Tom Randall, William Brewer. Perfect. So, and as I mentioned, everybody, this is a live show. They're, uh, the production studio can't do anything about the wind. We apologize. Uh, everything sounds great, though. And, and so you were talking about the, one of the things that you just mentioned about the Zinfandel, which struck me, and it was, it was funny while you were talking, Andrew, I was looking at it because I literally wanted to check the alcohol content. And then yeah. April, you said all the, all the Zinfandels are under 14%. Under 14%, bone dry, aged in French oak. So it's more of an old school California style. Uh, part of the classics. His Noel kind of came up with Ridge and Raffinelli and all, all that style that represents Dry Creek, but more so that that very reminiscent wine on the table, big dinners, growers, ag ag country here, and we're still that. And it's kind of like stepping back in time here. So we had our, our neighbor. I can jump in again one more. Just tell another story that that's real story from our neighbors, the Cunios that. They immigrated from Italy and we have a lot of Italian immigrants in Dry Creek and so they were making homemade wine and so a lot of Dry Creek, what people really wanted was a three boxes of Zinfandel, uh, one box of Petit Raw and some some white wine, uh, white grapes um, or you could put in carry on. So basically that's what everybody, that's the red wine that the California settlers drank because Zinfandel is what flourished here. It wasn't Cab or the, and so then they would mix and match but basically everybody drank Zinfandel growing up and then you can just make it either riper or not riper or more elegant or whatever so that's another just for real california that we're still making it like that um yeah. that's what people well, drink interesting too. i mean everyone it's it's fascinating to me because it's it's called america's heritage grape even though yeah. you know, the, Dav the davis studies indicated that it didn't come we didn't originate it but i did hear this that um we actually coined the, the name zinfandel so oh. it's it's not primitivo uh, you know, which is the Italian version, but we uh -huh. find the names Zinfandel, so we can hang our hat on that, which is fantastic. But I love the fact that you mentioned it's approachable, and you also use the adjective elegant. And and that is an adjective or a phrase that is rarely used with California Zinfandel. Yeah. Normally, <laughs> normally you hear, you know, cloying, uh, fruit bomb, uh, viscous, thick. I mean, I've had some Zins that are in the 16 and a half, 17%, where, you know, a couple more points, and it's a port. Uh, yeah. So, 
this is this is pretty darn special. And you mentioned kind of growing up with it. So so walk us through the generations and the vines were planted in 1917. You're you're still producing uh, wine from the vines today, but you, you got a few people doing this. So walk me through a couple of the generations that, on how it all happened and came together, because this is really what a family production winery is all about. Yeah, it's true. It is. And I'm, I got to jump in because it kind of all comes full circle. We just had a baby and her name's Ruby. And these old vines were planted by Ruby Henderlong. So we're kind of full circle here. But his dad, um, you can jump in from here. Yeah. Well, the reason they have, I mean, <laughs> it's, okay. his, it's his family history I mean, and I'm, I'm new to it. But why are we making um, wine still here? I mean, people were leaving no, Europe and no, your dad. Like, and no, why is my dad here? Um, well, that, the, generation. the generations yeah. are because my dad fell in love with my mom and her family had land here and they were getting out of Europe um, in the, the late 1800s because there was some turmoil and so you could homestead in Dry Creek and uh, that's how they ended up here because there were farmers from Switzerland and they needed to leave Switzerland of German Empire was ruling Switzerland area. And so they needed land where they could, if, if you could have a job which was raising sheep, then they would give you the land and they would section it off. So they came to Dry Creek um, on my mom's side. They actually were gonna be, <laughs> we're getting a little real here on the Zoom, but they were gonna be thrown in jail or executed if they didn't um, leave the country because they were caught breaking the law in Switzerland and so they immigrated to the US and yeah so then they were already farmers because everybody farmed anyway at that time um, and so really the vineyard is here because because of prohibition they started to farm grapes for people to make for home winemaking use because um, actually it became more valuable to be a farmer for grapes for home wine consumption because there was more demand because there was no wineries making it commercially because they cut it out so the price went up so realistically if they were trying to make a living as farmers they started growing the Zinfandel that we're still making wine from um, that the when prohibition was ending that they knew was ending but they, they could still sell for home winemaking so that's when they started planting the vineyards and that's well, why we're here today <laughs> I mean I like it and, and I wouldn't worry about the the criminal activity or behavior I'm sure the statute of limitations has long since run out <laughs> <laughs> I guess <laughs> I hope. Uh, let me actually just take a minute to kind of show people where you are located and, and let me know when you can see my screen. Oh yeah. All right, so, so let's go to your little spot of the world. And everyone, know, I'll stop right there for a second because you know, Cellar Angel specializes in Sonoma and Napa. And what most people don't recognize is just how vast Sonoma County yeah. is in, in relation to Napa. And, and every great wine region in the world is influenced by a maritime influence. So you have the San Pablo Bay down here, you've got the Pacific, and then of course you have all of these rivers and tri tributaries that actually slice through the mountains over millions of years of uh, evolution and sediment fallout and erosion create some unbelievable soil types, but where you guys are, I think is extra special because you're a little bit further north in the valley. And if I zoom in far enough, I can see you guys sitting right underneath this tree. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, there we are. There we are. <laughs> We're like right where that. So that is, um, the... that's our garage. <laughs> <laughs> that's our house. <laughs> no. Yeah, so this you can always tell is the old vine zen. Yeah. yeah. And how old is it? You said 1917? Uh, planted in, the property Actually, was bought in 1917. The old vines were it, planted in 1927. Well, that was when they first got the first crop, we believe. Yeah. So it took them a 10 year or so to kind of get the homestead settled. And they actually had some houses or chicken coops or apples and, and figs and other things right there. And so they planted the vineyard after they got the house built. And um, I believe if I'm telling yeah. it right. It wasn't all uh, grapes. They had apples and prunes and pears and um, so that's animals. A, um, that's a, our, the winery, the cellar is a living roof. Yeah. So that's why it kind of looks like a mound of green. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rosemary right. living roof. So there's 600 rose, 300 rosemary plants and it keeps it 
cool inside, like a, an mm. above ground cave, and the barrels love to age in there. Mm. And um, yeah, it smells well, good. It's, and that roof is actually the roof that's right over my shoulder. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. So, and, and it's, it's funny, when, when I saw this a year or so ago, when we first started working with each other, I, I was, and, and I shared a little bit about this before we started tonight, but that is an insane amount of rosemary. And, uh, <laughs> it is. And, and, and for those of us that um, purchase our rosemary in little plastic bins that are, you know, $9.99 at Trader Joe's or Whole Foods or, or Publix or wherever, I'm surprised you just don't have people walking up and just putting it in their car. I, mean, I think we should. Yeah. No, actually, we tell them they can pick Take it. Take a sprig of rosemary. When they come you. tasting, if they're walking out and they're going to do the roast chicken that night, they could. Um, have some well, and and the ro rosemary roast chicken is you know got to be a top five recipe when you've got it and, and the chicken and the potatoes and they're all just simmer yeah. simmering together and i'm wondering since you have, are such zinfandel pioneers what have you seen over the years that is just a rock solid can't miss uh food item to pair with your zins mm. so a lot of chefs around here love our zin because it's it's not too heavy it's not too hot it's very, it's very versatile that way. And there's a really well-known restaurant up in Geyserville called Catelli's, and they make an awesome chicken parmesan that's just like perfect with our zin. Um, but since it, our zin isn't too heavy, it really can go with a lot of things. And even in the summer, it's not too heavy of a red to drink with a barbecue or, or something like that. One of the and classics the that everybody <laughs> always talks about zen is always zen going with steak i mean with a little peppered steak ours is not super heavily peppered so a lot of the sommeliers say to kind of match the the wine with the food type so i mean but steak really freshly i mean not too just medium rare steak quickly grilled would be really nice um but yeah. the roast chicken also yeah. pork tenderloin a lot of pork uh, duck, we've had some great duck, um, duck confit, <laughs> yeah, or um, cassoulet would be really good in the yep. winter. Uh, but we also do a lot of veggie, like a, like a ratatouille, like a veggie, oh, yeah, uh, veggie stew is really good. And since our we sometimes people say we're making the pinot of Zinfandel, you can even do a little grilled kind of salmon, yeah. I mean, I, I really like, He's a I chef. like a lot of umami and um. I like mushrooms and uh, fresh veggies, and um, I mean, since we have the acidity, it can pair with tomato tomatoy dishes. So of course, like pizza, steak, uh, anything like that's the beauty of Zinfandel. That is why people had Zinfandel at almost every Sunday meal. Um, definitely pasta, and I mean, it pairs it with. Sounds in my it just it really depends what you're feeling that day, who you're with, and mm. and, and you, you talked about elegance. You, it's it's light. And when I say light, I don't mean like thin. I mean, it, it's got great body, but it, it is not that heavy, cloying, jammy, uh, over the top Zinfandel. And so I can see this paired with salmon. Uh, it, it is very elegant. It is very light on its feet. It's, it's nimble. It is so soft and silky too. So it is really, really a great wine. And, and this is, so our first vintage was in 1984. And it, our, we have always made wine to pair with food. Always. Um, we say moods and foods. And it really, it's been something that we, and his dad and Andrew and me, we all really value that aspect of food and wine. And we, you know, the, the acid on here is really nice and lively. So it's not overpowering. We're picking already, it's harvest. And we're, we're some of the first to pick. Um, and we always have been. People say once, once Nall starts crushing, that's when we'll just start getting ready for harvest. <laughs> and that's how we keep the alcohols down and we have the nice balance, the bright acidity, the flavors and all that. Um, kind of in well, balance. It's, it's funny because you, we've talked about food extensively because I think the wine is very versatile. Yeah, and, it is. And you, you have a, a pretty diverse portfolio. So uh, I'm gonna launch our first poll question. And for those okay. of you that actually don't know the poll questions, uh, welcome to legal gambling. We have a lot of money that rides on this. So, um, it <laughs> carries just, over from, it's kind of like Powerball. It carries over from week to week. We've had no winners. There's currently $11 in the pot. Um, but 
The first question tonight is food related. So I'm curious, since we're coming up into what, what I refer to as the feeding season with October, November, and December, uh. true or false? A difficult decision around the null Thanksgiving table is do we open our wine or someone else's? Uh. Mm. Now you guys can't answer yet. Oh, everybody uh. else answers. Everybody else is answering. Nice. So, so we will see, because uh, I don't know the answer to this, which is the beauty of these questions, to see what the winemaker and, and the family says. So we're going to give this about five, maybe eight more seconds, seven, six, five, ooh, a couple more votes coming in. We're at 70%, 73, 280, 84, zero. All right. So people think this is a difficult decision with 59% oh, yeah. true. 41% indicating false. It's not a difficult decision. So <laughs> tell us at the Thanksgiving table, what do you think? Heritage of wine, <laughs> what gets opened and how's that decision made? I would say oh. it's probably a difficult decision. <laughs> <Nice>. just <'cause>, <laughs> <laughs> but we do all have cellar palate. I mean, you uh, know, when you get used to something like you like Coke or Diet Coke better, we're just drink no we love no we have that's just always our number one choice but his dad does these things called blind tastings so we always bring our mm. blind tastings to the table and we just go crazy talking about it <laughs> but it's not like we're only going to have one bottle open yeah. right so i mean um <laughs> There's we're going to always have bottles. an all and then we're always going to have somebody else's or we're going to have well now we're making the full spectrum but we might have a a late heart or we have a Riesling maybe or we can't really make Riesling or we try to make you know when you go to restaurants where you can't really make it yourself now we, we, yep. we try to have wines that we can't make ourselves so we're gonna go get oh, those cool. um so we'll just pick up because we're yeah the German Rieslings are all over the uh ripeness spectrum and then sparkling even though we're making sparkling but we want to try champagnes or um I have to go or even any, yeah, anything kind of the aperitif, like the white wines, maybe, and then, um, but then we love Beaujolais too. So we, we pretty much run the whole. It's whatever we have in the cellar, and it's it's spur of the moment. But uh, my dad will always having have something interesting, and so we always mystery. Yeah, we never really open the wines knowing what they are. So oh, nice. Okay. Well, you, you mentioned you, you mentioned that you you um, are making a sparkling. I know you're making a cab. Obviously, we're drinking the Zen. I don't think many people, unless they're diehard fans, know that you make a sparkling. So why don't walk me through the portfolio? And as you're describing them, tell me a little bit about case production. Yeah. Of each. That's April. Oh, I can do that. Yeah. So we do make a sparkling. We love sparkling, but we only make about four uh, four barrels of it. It's made in the traditional champagne method. 100 cases. 100 cases. Um, uh, traditional champagne method, but no dosage, so there's no sugar, but it has that nice creamy texture, but real lively and bright. And we pretty much drink it all <laughs> before we sell it. Um, yeah, we, we don't make very much. We make a little bit of an estate the Sauvignon girl. Blanc, made in more of a Sancerre oh. style. Yeah, it's um, all these small production wines go to the club. So that we make them for the club, we make them because we like them. And so we make an estate Sauvignon Blanc that is um, somewhat of a Sancerre, California Sancerre style. It's aged in neutral, fermented in neutral French oak, and then it goes to malolactic, so it has a nice round mouth feel, um, but it's still bright because we pick early too. And then of course we make our classic Zin, which you guys are drinking, which is what the winery was founded on. And we, um, we make the most of that. Uh, Doug, in fact, only used to make this wine. Um, and then we make a Pinot Noir from the oh, Russian wow. River. Oh, and yep. we have a lot of <laughs> Pinot followers. It's more of a Burgundian style, but it has that really nice fresh California fruit. And we do make 100% estate old vines in, and then a single <laughs> vineyard designate in. So we're a Zin house. Yeah. What is, what's, what's case production on the old vines in? Old vines what? About 200, 200, 200 maybe cases. Yeah. Most of our wine goes to the club. We make only about 15 to 2,000, 1,500 to 2,000 cases. Right. I, I was just going to say, based upon what you're saying, that it sounds like you're running around 1,500 cases, but depending on yeah. the yeah. yield. Okay. Right. Yeah. Any, any desire to get bigger, or that's big enough? Um, 
We are, as Andrew and I are more in charge and take over. His dad's still here. We call him the Zen Master, and he's. It's a real family production. I mean, it's just us. And um, uh, okay. yes, we we have 20 total estate acres, and as these, they've been in long-term contracts for a long time, and as they come out, we're going to use the estate grapes for our own production, which will kind of get us at a sweet spot of about. Um, 3,000 cases maybe, but we'll never gonna go more than no, five, three to four, never, never more, more than 5,000 probably. <laughs> I mean. Well, uh, it's interesting too, because I mean, you're, it is a family production. It's not as if you're at 40,000 cases and there's 150 people and you've got sales and marketing and a whole yeah. division, you know, pushing. It's family, it's, it's fourth generation, soon to be fifth generation, uh, right. whether, they know, whether they know it or not. Right now. <laughs> And, and so, I mean, Andrew, I, I have to believe you know probably every vine. You, you've worked with your father and you were crawling in the vineyard and walking in the vineyard. And, and so what, talk me through how gratifying it is to just to, to live among the vines and actually have this be your vocation. Uh, it's, a, it's a blessing. That's why we're pairing with Cellar Angels. I, I'm fortunate to uh, be here. I mean, because I think without my family or April that, I mean, I wouldn't appreciate it or I wouldn't be able to work as hard to continue it because I, when we see, when I wake up every day and we look at it, we have to have somebody to share it with. And I mean, now we, we have that going forward and it's gratifying because I have somebody to share it with. I, I think when I was younger, I, I didn't know if, who would really want to work this hard <laughs> to carry it on because sometimes you have to be really patient actually when you're farming and making the wine, it doesn't just happen overnight. And so I, every day we, we count our lucky stars that we're still here because uh, there is a lot of things that goes on where nature is not, is pretty, I mean, you have to be able to adjust to nature. Uh, it's not as tranquil as it sometimes it se seems. I mean, now we're kind of, but I mean, I, I'm just, I'm a really, every day I appreciate it more, I, w I would say that. I just and the more that I make wine, I just feel like I don't. I mean, there's so much more to learn. Every vintage just throws you a curveball. Every you're constantly adjusting. Well, and that's it's funny because you. I mean, farming is not easy. You're at the mercy of Mother Nature, and, and Mother Nature, I think, over the last five to seven years, has been just sitting there going, "What can I do to wine country this year?" <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah, specifically, uh, I think, so, I think it's yes. the way it's presented too. I mean, well, we're, we're, we're doing that, well here, though. You we're, guys, uh, I mean, I know you, and for everyone that pays attention to wine country, either through us or, the, or other wine channels, that we all recognize that California had a, a record fire season again, and and you folks were evacuated. You, which during harvest, I mean, harvest is frantic enough to have to be evacuated during harvest. That just adds, like you said, and you another wrinkle and something that you're going to have to deal with. You're you're now back at the property and uh, you're, you're working harvest. And so if someone wants to taste with you either virtually or if they want to come visit you, how do they do that? Yeah, no, we have- <laughs> I don't Talk know, to I April. Know. Yeah, that's my job. Um, uh, talk to you guys. No, no, we, no, we are here. We, we're, we, we're here, yeah. We're here, our taste room is at the working cellar. Um, we, we have an outside space for tasting, so we're open. It's by appointment now, because it has to be because of COVID. Um, we're really safe. We follow all the protocols and um, so you can actually go on our website and make a reservation to taste. You can also just email me april at nullwinery.com and I can set something up. We, we can always jump on Zoom. I can, we can always talk about the wines just via a call. We're here. We're always here. And um, um, yeah, the tasting is right here. Is right you here. do the tasting yeah. right where we're standing. You can come back here. Yeah look at the vines and I mean it's, it's pretty darn impressive and, and for those of you we've got now uh, at least 26 people on zoom I don't know how many are on Facebook so hello everybody on Facebook uh, but just there's a lot of people drinking the Zinfel Zinfandel tonight and I want to let folks know how they got that Zinfandel so uh, this is if I can do it correctly um, this is the Cellar Angels website and what folks do is you go to the Cellar Angels website, you can actually go to shop, uh, you can click on the wines, you can click on the sip kits and verticals, and it will bring you right down to the sip kits and verticals, 
There's custom collections that we've put together for uh, people that are huge cab lovers. But this right here is the shelter in place virtual tasting kit. Every week that changes. So if you were to go order that today, for the next six Fridays in a row, you will have a bottle of wine to taste along with the winemaker. And again, portions of every single transaction go to a charity you select. So you get access to great wines that you would never find, like the Null Zinfandel, uh, and you also get to benefit a charity at the same time. So it's uh, what we've been doing for 10 years. We're just storytellers drinking great wine. Uh, as I like to say, uh, we drink serious wines, we just don't take ourselves seriously. So that's, right on. That's like no. And we love we working go. with you guys because we really awesome. truly appreciate the sip and give aspect of it. It's something that we really like to be a part of. And um, also you guys are good with technology so we can do this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, we have some technology failures all the time. How do we get that rosemary background that you have? Like I want that too. I can send you that. I'll even send it to you with the Null logo. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I like it. Uh, so, Andrew, what, what number of harvest is this of yours? Pretty much every one that we've had, except for three while I was at college. Um, so Where'd you go to school? University of Redlands right here. <laughs> <laughs> Redlands, Bulldogs. We're, yep. Wearing it proud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so when you, when you went to college, did you choose any classes that were related to this field or were you unsure of what you wanted to do or was college really like I viewed college as just a vacation? Um, actually, I went to college, <laughs> I don't know, how do we, uh, like I, I, I went to the same college as my dad went for undergraduate and I, I majored in philosophy because you could just sit on the bus when we go to the baseball games and write your papers and read the books and you didn't have to go to class and you just turn in your paper. And so I could play sports and get a degree and try to figure out what my purpose was. And I felt like my purpose was to make wine. The irony of it is we had about 350 graduates from Redlands in 2002. And both of us are making wine, one in Washington and I'm making wine. So I think it was meant to be making wine. And actually, as I was finishing the philosophy paper, I had to write a 37 page thesis for just my undergraduate, but you could have been more. And I only wrote the week. 37 page paper if I wrote 50 or 60 I would have got a honors uh, I knew I didn't want to do philosophy that I want to make wine which is why the other guys making wine too probably but uh okay I could go on but like that's where no, we I, I, I like that because I mean, what it does it, it gives you a foundational background for winemaking I mean winemaking is very philosophical it's very artistic along with the science side so it's both right and left brain and and you have to I mean you're an artist in my opinion because every year you, you have certain instruments and certain tools. You've got the vines, you've got the soil, you've got the vineyard, you've got the history, you've got the age, you've got the experience. That stuff is semi-constant, but the one variable that you cannot control obviously is mother nature. So she forces you to pivot, she forces you to adapt, she forces you to, to think on your feet. And, and I think you said it earlier, which I, I totally appreciate and agree with, you have to have patience. You, you really, and it's an untold skill. There's people that, I mean, we live in an immediate gratification society, right? You know, I, I do a Google search, I get 375 million responses in less yeah. than a second. So how do, you, how do you practice that patience with also the desire and urge to, to really want to produce, like you said, the, the best Zinfandel and the best wines in the world? Um practice mindfulness <laughs> actually yeah. um which is uh something that i got into through philosophy i studied all the different religions and um i have to work on it every day because actually when i was working in kitchens and i was cooking that's what i loved about cooking and that's why people gravitate towards beer in a way earlier because you can do the beer fast and you can check your mistakes and it, or cooking if you make a mistake you can throw it away or somebody else can eat it, you can feed it to the dog, but like with wine, if you mess up, you know, you're kind of stuck with it or you've got to really, you got to work hard to adjust and um, make some longer. Anyway, so I would say that, uh, yeah, I think that every day you have to do something else while you're waiting on the wine to take care of your impatience. So you have to have another channel of artistic ability 
to therefore then go back to your wine because you have to take a break and then come back fresh because if you spend too much time on the wine like you'll the impatience will get to you and so you have to constantly be readjusting for the into the patients because a lot of the best winemakers are really detail oriented and they want things to go fast but then they've learned how to balance the patients because they're making wine in the moment you have to make really quick decisions but you have to anticipate it and then know how to anticipate it and make that decision in the moment and then know when to wait yeah. So that comes from experience. You need to know to go make a fast decision on when to pick or when to rack or what to do with the wine and then sit back. So right, it right. doesn't just, you, and you can't just learn that overnight. Yeah. And no, you, yeah. that's why I watch this with my dad and uh, the best winemakers have the most experience. So I just don't know how the best winemakers can just get a degree and say they, they, they can do it. I mean, they can ferment sugar into alcohol. I mean, a lot of people, and now with YouTube and anything, you can, you can do almost anything with uh but can you do that artistic ability where it's something really memorable and that that you your family the legacy is carried on like that people and I, also think, your style. I, I love the mindfulness aspect because you know a strong component of an ingredient of mindfulness is being the present so it's not thinking ahead it's it's not worrying about decisions it's just staying focused in the present and and that's actually a very powerful tool to have at you, in your arsenal uh, when when winemaking. And you're right, it, you don't get that coming out of college. That takes a few vintages to get underneath your belt. And with age comes wisdom is what we've always been told. And it's certainly true in winemaking. And and April, I want to turn to you now is because you've got the name Viticulturist or the label right. Viticulturist after. <laughs> What 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 is that, and and what does that person do? <laughs> yeah, she's so, awesome. Um, <laughs> so I have a, a master's in viticulture, which is basically wine grape growing. So um, I'm out in the vineyards all the time. I'm growing grapes to make wine, it's in a specific style of wine. And um, so yeah, it's it's kind of like we're in production, uh, like bringing it back to what we were talking about. We're production people, we're boots on the ground. He's in the cellar shoveling tanks. I'm in the vineyard looking at grapes. And um, it's, we don't do a lot, we don't do a lot of marketing cause that's, that's we're small and we do the production, but um, that's really what makes family wineries, I think um, worth going to and worth trying because we care seriously and only about the wine. And we're, we're, we're in it all, in all aspects, aspects of it. So. so every night we walk through the vineyard with our kids and yeah. then we look at the vines. So we get to walk, we get to see the vines every 24 hours at least, if not 12. And we have them right outside. But April. Yeah, I always say my job's done because the grapes are in the, the winery and you can deal with it now. <laughs> but actually we do it all together. So I think it's cool. Sometimes, sometimes yeah. do that too. We go walking through the vines, but oftentimes that's called trespassing, and people have asked us. <laughs> you have to come here soon. I think the we cool thing it. too, yeah, is like the farming or the grape growing, grape or the wine growing and the wine making. We're really fine tuning that, and that's ultimately I think what all wineries really want to have, where they're in your farm, you're growing it, because like some wineries, they're uh, they're just making the wine and they're growing the grape. Anyway, that's what I love about April. We're, we're, we got both sides going, so it's beautiful. Well, I, I think it is. I mean, the dynamic duo might be kind of overstated, but you do have both sides, and you've got someone walking the vines that's, that's not just damn good at what she does. She's committed to the family. Uh, she, yeah, she, yeah. You know, uh, she said, I do a while ago, so this is it. So she has a master's in this, so I, my guess is she's pretty darn good. You're in the cellar. And so it's kind of fascinating because I haven't seen this before where you've got, uh, yes, husband and wife winemaking teams and winery owners and those sorts of things. I mean, trust who trust us. We love uh, husband and wife teams because we know what it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, especially, exactly. especially in a pandemic. Um, <laughs> I'm surprised we're still a, here. <laughs> you, have, you have an amazing component. There's a chemistry there that not many wineries can can produce or reproduce rather. And so it is kind of nice. I would imagine there's a lot of dinner table conversations that are saying like, you know, block five is doing such and oh, such. Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah. That's um, all we and, talk and, about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So is it, uh, I mean, April, how did you get into it? Um, actually, that's kind of a funny story, but I, so when I was
was younger, you know, you're not really sure what you want to do. And everybody's like, do what you love in your 20 something. You're like, what do I love? Oh, I love drinking wine. <laughs> um, <Yeah>. But <laughs> so no, I was actually working at a restaurant in San Francisco called Pauline's and they'd been there a long time. And actually <laughs> null wine was sold there. And um, yeah. I really got into it. I really loved it. It was a farm to table. Uh, oh, so yeah, <laughs> family, they'd been there 35 years too. And they started making their own wine and I really jumped into it and I loved it. And I said, you know, I want to do this. So I kind of did some research and figured out that there was a really good program in Australia. And I went there and I got my degree and I worked, managed a vineyard out there and then came back and met Andrew. But the funny thing is the whole time I was in Australia, I had his mom's Le Null <laughs> winery card in my wallet and oh, yeah. I didn't know Andrew then. And she then, never met me that night. But I knew his wine. <laughs> and then we restaurant. met and it kind of goes from there. But I was a, I was actually grow relations in the Central Valley for Constellate Woodbridge for a long time and not a long time, a, a while. And then moved here and was grow relations at Rodney Strong for a little while. And then we decided to just go all in. And so now we're here. Now well, I'm that's, here. A, that's actually a little, uh, <laughs> little mindfulness manifestation there. <laughs> she oh, the yeah business card I did. I manifested I mean, that's, that that's pretty good pretty impressive <laughs> I joke that he just needed he, he just married me because he needed a worker <laughs> I mean, oh, man. don't knock that April there's some genius in that <laughs> that's true that is true <laughs> now are mom, and, are mom and dad still active or are they retired and now watching you and directing you they're active uh, they're active as ever still they they sit on the mountain and look over and whenever we need, they can see we're in, they jump in, they, they can see when we need some help. They, yeah, they're, they know what they're doing because they've been doing it so long and they pretty much, we wouldn't be here still without them still chipping in. That's I mean, like I his, only, his only <laughs> harvest worker right That's, now. That is why I call him the, the Zen master because I, I do, we, I, I think you can't really make wine or just like in a vacuum, I think the way you get ideas or create is you have to bounce ideas off people um yep. so it helps to have the family still we still talk about everything game plan and, we're, and we're um, really work lucky. together yeah they're we're, we're, we're lucky because we have yeah both of our sets of parents really but um care about us and care about our future and they really help us my parents are our biggest fans and his parents are still working and we're just lucky to have that uh commitment but they're more in the background luckily yeah i mean they can hang out <laughs> but is there, I mean, you're, and you're right, Andrew, it's got to be kind of comforting to, to not only, uh, you know, let's say you're sitting in the, in, in the barrel room or in the tank and you're, you're like, you have a question and, and it's great to be able to bounce ideas off people that you respect in the winemaking side of things, but it's also pretty magical to have that person also be your father. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> we, I mean, yeah, we, 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 cause you can say certain things to your, loved ones that you can't say to somebody you don't love so um that i, <laughs> I think <laughs> i don't yeah i don't know where that what i just said there but no. basically yeah, yeah there, there's, there's, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of conversations in the cone of silence with that <laughs> <laughs> but um what you just said is true there's a level of um honesty and and like and genuineness that you can have when you work with your family that you yep you know that you don't have when you work for a big company yeah because they have to be your parent your family has to be more honest with you so you're able to make decisions on whether to fish or cut bait and make the best whatever product because you don't have somebody disagreeing with you because they're somebody yeah, else and, and there, there's there's no hidden agendas and there's yeah. and also you, you can't sugarcoat anything you can't bs anything it's your family yeah. they know where all the skeletons are and, and they know the mo and so and speaking of family i've got a question where there's a i believe some some literature on the website that talks about the winemaking family of 2042 oh that's a, <laughs> that's our kids uh, we have three kids we have um uh, a four-year-old, oh, a three-year-old, and a six-month-old. So we are putting the, the family, the family and family, the family, the family and family winery. <laughs> um, they already so say they're winemakers. They do. They already say they're going to be I winemakers. Like <laughs> and we're like, okay, you better be. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I mean. So a four, a three, and a six-month-old. Okay, so that's a, that's a busy household. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're just wild through them. Sometimes my son comes in after with the when they've been walking through the vineyard and he's head to toe in dirt and I'm what is that wild animal? It's my son. <laughs> <laughs> So let me, I'm going to, um, we talked a little bit about the old vine Zinfandel, which reminded me of, of the second poll question. So now the second poll question is, it's, it's an essay question. So you're going to have to submit your written answers. I'm just teasing. It's a 37 page thesis request of which. <laughs> I um, all right, here we go. So everyone's getting, the, getting to their keyboard. Null has received historic vineyard designation. And to do so, you can go like this and go whoop whoop. April, I, I saw April <laughs> raising to do, to do so, a vineyard must still be producing fruit today and be 50 plus years of age, have at least one third of the existing producing vines that can actually be traced back to the original planting or all of those. So now what's interesting to me is there is no certification for old vine, right? Uh, so it, it kind of right. kind of gets, and we talk about this a lot at Cellar Angels because we're huge old vines in fans. Yeah. And I'm, I'm gonna give this about 10 more seconds. We've got 57% of the people have responded. Okay, put down the charcuterie and cheese and, and let's pay attention. 73%, <laughs> uh, five, four, Three, two, one. Yeah, but I mean, what's like legal? Yeah. Oh my god! Is it too sunny? All right. Should we move? So, Martin, do you think we should move? Some nice sun, vitamin D. I love it. Do you think we should move out of the sun? Is it I, if it's sunny? not bothering you guys, you look great. Okay, it's kind of. If oh, you're okay. melting, you can move. No, I mean I'm okay. This is nothing. Tomorrow it's gonna be 109. So. Yeah. It's All right. So. So a historic vineyard designation, we've got seven, eighty percent, eighty-one percent of the people got it correct. So I think it's pretty impressive that you get yeah, this that's designation. Good. Yeah. And and when you think about it, uh, folks, I mean, I mean, you have the vine has to be still the vines have to be still producing fruit and be fifty years of age, and one third of your vintage has to come from the original mm -hmm. planting. I mean, that's incredible. How long have you had this historic? How long have you had this historic designation? Sorry, it's a. Um, uh, Two years, maybe? Yeah, about a few years. Two but years? yeah, to be, you're right. There is no legality for old vine to call something old vine. Um, but the Historic Vineyard Society, which we're now a part of, says that your vineyard has to be, um, the old vine should be 50 years or older. And, and I mean, I love old vines in just because there's the, they are these stump work of art. You know, they've seen things that most people haven't seen, especially when you start getting into the 75, 85, 95 years of age. And you just, and, and Andrea, I'm going to hearken back to the mindfulness thing again, because I think it's pretty powerful. When you recognize what that vine has witnessed and, and, and seen from a historic perspective, and yet here you are able to grab a few clusters off of it, craft yeah. it and, and put it into a bottle and, and you're just kind of like the, the, the messenger, the carrier. And, mm. and I mean, that's gotta be pretty gratifying. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, every day I wake up, I'm thinking about how that bottle, <laughs> how that grapevine will make the best one glass of wine per day, kind of how, and 10 years later. So um, I think it's, again, I have to do the mindfulness where I have to be in the moment too, where I can look at the vine, but I also have to be like, okay, what do I have to do next? But I mean, as far as the gratification, I think just the fact that I have a little system to be present and to bring and to know the stages of the vine and then to know how to kind of get the wine, not kind of, but I mean, I do, but every vintage is different just to get into the bottle of how I want it to shine with our stamp on it that, that makes it gratifying. I mean, once I get it in the bottle, then I almost have to wait another five years. So we're like, we're almost like we gotta, we, my dad and I, we also think about like 10 years out, but then, and then cause his side of the family is from Kentucky. We call it Kentucky windage. So we're like, we're thinking really far out yeah. for gratifying. And that's why when I'm talking to people, even about the 18 or the, the harvest now, I think I have to work both sides of the fence. I have to be present and I have to know 
I mean, so I, I think learning to be gratified in the moment and then later, it's it, 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 every day I have to work on the, like appreciating it in the moment because we're, we are thinking ahead and our culture is, I keep on thinking that the wine, I try to make it so that it can be ready sooner, but then I keep going back to our roots. I'm like, no, I have yeah. to go back. I'm with the roots. I mean, yeah. the, the Italians have been making wine for a couple thousand years. I think they've learned a few things. Yeah. Yeah, and then um, bringing it back, yeah. bringing it back to our style, it, it's it's interesting to sit here and think how these vines produced wine back then too, and the, the the style that we make reflects that, and the way we farm reflects that because we dry farm and it's really intensive. You have to cross cultivate; it's all hands on. Everything is picked from hand. Just sitting here, having a glass of wine, looking at the vineyard, we could be in 1927 through to 2020. And, and that's pretty cool that we've been keeping to, yeah, mm -hmm. our roots and, and, the, right. and, and the style of farming. Mm -hmm. And like back to production too, we make such a small production, but that is reflective of our style because the way we make it is, is um, very traditional and it's really hands-on, it's very intensive. You couldn't make a lot of wine like that. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's, I, that's kind of, I yeah. I wanna say hello to Ed St. John on Facebook. That is oh, uh, and, <laughs> and We love it. We have to go over here because it's too sunny. Sorry. <laughs> this is our this is our first completely mobile sip tasting. <laughs> We're just. Uh, it's like burning us it, up. it was like I couldn't see anything. <laughs> no, I don't know if they can even see. Can us. you see us though, or is this too dark? No, there you go. Okay. It's a little better. It was just Perfect. like sorry. I was like looking directly into the sun. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, you look great. Uh, <laughs> So we talked about future case production, maybe type of thing. We talked about the, the vineyard staff of 2042. Uh, it would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about kind of the craziness of this year and, and what you think this harvest is going to be like. I mean, we, we were glad that you are safe and, and it, it does put things in perspective when you, when you see what's happening. Tell me a little bit about the, the 2020 harvest and, and what you think is going on with the grapes and and how you're doing with everything oh man that's the big question right now i mean this is this is everybody says at unprecedented times but we got evacuated and the next day we're basically harvesting and there's a question of smoke taints just in the area in sonoma and napa there's a lot going on there um but what we've brought in what we've crushed is how we like it we picked it when we wanted it we don't detect any smoke taint and so so far it's good it's, it's just been just you know pandemic fires <laughs> newborns um everything mm -hmm. you name it but thankfully they've been doing this for so long that you kind of you know the vineyard like the back of your hand you kind of know when you start going actually we get the adrenaline during harvest yeah. and we kind of look forward to harvest and, and we call it crush fever and i mean we're the wines are great so far so I mean, right. people have that to look forward to, and we're just doing what we always do, and and the smoke's cleared pretty much yeah. now. So I think like we're just gonna be positive and hope for the. I mean, we're just believing the best. But you can rest assured that Nall, we're so detail oriented, <laughs> so crazy about our wine and how we make it that if anything is off with this year, we won't, we will not release the it. The wines will be good. But we'll make them. But thus far, better, than, better we, than good. Yeah, thus far, everything is up to par. Well, and I, I would imagine, and I'll let you verify it, but when your name's on the bottle, it seems like there's a little bit added pressure to make certain that it's pretty damn good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I said, there's no marketing. It's all about the wine, truly. I live and die by the wine, obsessed on the wine. Him and his dad, me and him, every, we, 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 we care about the wine like it's our child. Um, and more than that, we care. We we the people who've been with Nall and know Nall and following Nall for many years are true friends, and they and we care about them too. It's like they get it; they're part of our group, and that's what why we make wine. Yeah, that they're part of the tribe. So yeah. let me ask you: How do you turn it off? And when you turn it off, you know wh what's your go-to? Is it music? Do you like to travel? I know you mentioned <laughs> cooking. Is is there a, is there a happy place? To just kind of shut things down what do you do to stay sane mm. uh, 6 a.m crossfit and um 
Like, <laughs> we li- I blast music all day long. I probably listen to music so much that it annoys my dad and my wife. But, like, with my kids, they don't care. We listen to music <laughs> all day long. I'll never turn the music off unless it's, like, so it's, yeah, music all day and food. Yeah. And then lifting is weights. There, is there a, a musical genre? Is there a certain band or is there a certain decade? What, what's, what's the music? Uh, <laughs> there's probably music you've never heard of but I mean I had this like wild dream that I wanted to be a DJ when I was going to school in Australia but I mean right now with my kids we've been listening to Christmas carols believe it or not my and uh, <laughs> Third Eye Blind yeah. no we're listening so, I, sh- I shouldn't say this but they love this. We, we like Christmas whenever they because it across, reminds them yeah. of presents they came across <laughs> the um, Jingle Bells Farting Elf <laughs> And they think okay. it's so funny. Can we say that? <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't say that, but they think it's hilarious. Yeah, they, they, they said you can say that. Okay. <laughs> uh, that is hilarious. I, I, I'm going to have to actually check that out. And I love the fact that there's just Christmas carols being blasted in, in August. In <laughs> oh, we play the guitar while we play. The, yeah. I, so I play the guitar. Yeah. yeah. I'm learning the guitar. Actually, I love guitar. Forgot about that. Um, acoustic, electric, acoustic guitar for to play kid songs again, but not. I can't do the fart song on the acoustic. Yeah. <laughs> now we're going a little too right. far. Yeah. Slacker. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. No. All right, um, you guys are outstanding. It, it's. Uh, I mean, I'm going to have to fill my glass up and toast you. Uh, yeah. We've gone from 13.9 percent Zinfandel to fart Christmas songs all in one episode. You can thank my four-year-old for that because she thinks it's so funny. I'm like, it, it, what month is it? I have no idea. Yeah. That's kind of cool though. Um, yeah. I do want to let everybody know that, uh, again, every transaction helps a charity. We're actually kind of focusing in a little bit of spotlight right now on World Central Kitchen and Chef Jose Andres. Nice. Because, mm. uh, they're a charity partner of ours. They don't know it. We actually just wanted to help them and we put their letter or their masthead on our masthead and, and they, they do amazing things because this is a gentleman that built this organization and goes previously went around to every single natural disaster around the globe and now is in Louisiana and Texas feeding people that were displaced from Hurricane Laura. He's been to California, he's been to Portland, he's been all over just helping people and it's kind of interesting to me at more of a we talked about a mindfulness it is, uh, you know, we talk about wine bringing people together, wine and food, okay? So this is yeah. what Chef Jose Andres does. And when you go to Cellar Angels to make a purchase, you can just click on disaster relief and, and that's where your funds will go to to help them because that takes resources. And a lot, oftentimes those resources are both human and financial. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's interesting, I, I'm gonna steal something from someone that we had as a guest last week from our military charity partner, Folds of Honor, because he said something that really makes a lot of sense where, at Folds of Honor, they want your time, they want your talents, and they, they want your treasures. And, and they aren't saying they want all your treasures, but they do need money because when you're giving military scholarships to people of fallen heroes, it, it requires some financial resources. So all of us are drinking wine. Uh, we're all in this together. And mm. you can do great things with great wine and still benefit people. And then together, and getting back to that serendipity and mindfulness thing, uh, there's a lot of positive energy that's going to get generated from that. So when you have good food, good people, good wine, uh, usually the end result is pretty damn special. And as a perfect indication, I'd like to refer to the 2018 Nulls Infandel. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew, April, you guys have been outstanding. Thank you for putting up with us for an hour. <laughs> we had fun. We, this we, is great. We see all I that. Th- I'm looking at names that we know. I thought we had more to go. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> thought no, we were going to keep going. It, it goes fast. <laughs> yeah. um, and the networks don't like when we go over. It's really expensive. <laughs> um, actually, uh, next week we've got Lindsay Hoops from Hoops Vineyard over in Napa and Small Production Cabernet. A pretty interesting story as well. And so that's what we do. We, we're, we're storytellers. Uh, there's nothing more gratifying to us than why we founded the company 10 years ago to share stories like this. And so uh, it's humbling. I love learning everything about you guys. I can't wait to see you in person and give you a hug when we don't have to yeah. social distance and, and, meet the, and meet the vineyard team of 2042. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers to that. Awesome. <laughs> Cheers to that. You guys Cheers. be safe, be good. And thank you so much for sharing some time with us. Thanks everyone. This is great. You. Thank yeah. you for having Cheers. us. Thanks. We loved it. Thank you.